to stay connected uh, in some way while uh, we can't be together physically. Um, so we uh, are making them publicly available to make sure everyone who's interested can, can learn more about these topics. Um, just a little bit uh, about IEC. So the Illinois Environmental Council was uh, founded in 1975 uh, by a group of dedicated uh, grassroots environmental advocates. And since then, we've, we've led an issue campaigns by uh, allowing environmental organizations to pool their resources and create a higher profile for all the issues that, that we're working on together. Um, today, we have over 90 environmental and community organization affiliate members and nearly 400 individual members throughout Illinois. Um, if you're not a member of IEC, um, either you or your, um, your organization, you can learn more about becoming a member at islandviro.org slash donate. Um, my name is Matt Steffen. I'm the deputy director at IEC and helping me on the technical side today is Tucker Berry, our communications director. Um, and then uh, just a, a few housekeeping item, items uh, for this session. Uh, so everyone is muted by default. Um, and that's just because we have so many participants that it would get too crazy if, if we had people off mute. So um, we still want people to participate though. And the best way to do that, feel free to, to share your, your video feed um, so our speakers can see you. Um, and if you have questions, comments, or want to provide links or resources about any of the topics we cover today, please put them in the chat. Um, Tucker's going to help me kind of moderate that as, as we go. Um, and then time permitting at the end of the presentations, we're going to run through the stack of questions and comments and so on uh, so that our presenters can respond. Um, so uh, today I would like to, uh, to welcome our two presenters. So uh, we have with us today Audrey Wenning from the Metropolitan Planning Council and Linda Lopez from the Active Transportation Alliance. So personally, I think it's really boring when people just read bios of presenters. I really like to hear how presenters talk about themselves and their work. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and throw it to uh, Audrey and Linda to introduce themselves. So uh, Audrey, do you want to start us off? Sure. I'll go ahead and um, share my screen so you can sort of see the organization I'm from. Uh, again, my name is Audrey Wenning. I'm the Director of Transportation for the Metropolitan Planning Council. And MPC is an 85-year-old nonprofit organization. We work at the regional level uh, in the Chicago region. We work on a range of urban planning issues uh, to try to make the region more sustainable, prosperous, and equitable. Uh, some of my colleagues work on water resources issues, land use and development issues, uh, and other types of planning issues, which are very intersectional. And I specialize in transportation. Uh, Really, I have a lot of focus on multimodal transportation, on, on transportation safety, on uh, performance-based planning, so use of our resources most effectively, uh, and just uh, you know doing original research on the issues that we feel are not um, being explored as much as they could be, and uh, trying to advocate for good policy in the region. Great, thank you, Audrey, and then. Uh, our, our second speaker today is Linda Lopez. So, uh, Linda, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Sure, I'm Linda. I'm with the Active Transportation Alliance. I'm an advocacy manager. Um, I came on last year uh, when I was writing uh, the Fair Fares Report with Julia Garrisomenko at Active Trans as well, um, which was released in the fall. And before that, I did a lot of writing around transportation and housing um, issues. Um, that was the lens that I approached transportation um, when I was writing for Streets Blog and other publications. Um, so kind of my entryway for, to this work was uh, journalism. Um, I also been doing a lot of work around um, like exploring equity within this field. So I'm part of a national collective called The Untokening, which is a multiracial collective of people in transit and mobility. Um, interested in centering uh, marginalized communities in uh, mobility justice. So I'll be talking about that in my presentation. Um, and Audrey and I have worked together um, on a few different things. I'm on the transportation committee at MPC and we were part of the Women Changing Transit Mentoring Program with Transit Center. I was a mentee and Audrey was a mentor. So 
we've had some different work together in the last few years. Which, which include being on a diverted flight to St. Louis and taking, <laughs> and taking the 4.30 a.m. Amtrak train home. That was fun. <laughs> uh, a bonding experience. <laughs> Great. So thank you both. Uh, and then with that, I think um, Audrey uh, will present first today. So Audrey, if uh, you want to go ahead and get started. Sure. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, I, I'm the Director of Transportation at the Metropolitan Planning Council and really excited to be here today. Um, MPC is a longtime member of the Illinois Environmental Council. It's a really effective coalition and we're so happy to be able to, to talk about um, biking and walking and its role in environment. So I am trying to advance my slides, there we go. Um, so we are talking, we're gonna start out talking about uh, biking walk and walking in the COVID era, uh, but also I'm, I'm gonna to wanna to talk a bit about, you know, how we think about this, not only now during the peak of the crisis, but as we transition out of that and how this is going to be changing uh, transportation in the future. Uh, right now, we are, you know, at home, we are asked not to travel uh, unless we have to. Uh, and there are a large number of people that do have to that are essential workers, so they are commuting. Um, they may be taking transit um, or they might be biking and walking to work. Um, they may be deciding to take those modes because it allows them to socially distance more. Um, so those are essential, biking and walking are essential transportation modes for commuting. Um, and then for those of us that are working from home, uh, we are maybe doing a little bit of walking um, and biking for exercise and fresh air in the limited times that we get out um, to do essential trips or for a little bit of exercise. Uh, and certainly these, you know, this is an environmentally friendly uh, way to get around uh, during this time. But what has been going on, you know, in the bigger picture with transportation is, you know, it's really been very upended and uh, there's never been a time, I don't think anyone has, uh, that has worked on transit or transportation advocacy has ever said, you know, please avoid riding transit and please ride on empty buses, if at all possible. You know, this is a very, very upended situation where people are trying to uh, socially distance while they're, while they're traveling around. And so throughout the country, different regions and cities have been taking different emergency measures. Um, and this map is even already outdated because it's changing every day, but um, so different locations are, uh, you know, doing different things with their transit fares, um, their bike share. So Chicago shows up here as um, offering free bike share. Um, some other places are doing street closures or temporary bike lanes or other types of measures. Um, automated crossing is like where you don't have to press the pedestrian button um, in some suburban areas to get the crosswalk light. Um, so automating that so people don't have to touch anything. Um, so there's a wide range of of emergency measures being tested um, throughout the country, um, some of which are, you know, helping to prioritize biking and walking because it is safer now. Uh, but I think it's really important to think about what this is going to mean uh, once we transition out of uh, the stay-at-home order. So, you know, in Illinois, we've been at home for five weeks or so. Uh, we don't know for sure yet, but it looks like it's going to be a little bit longer. Um, you know, maybe it's another month. Uh, and then uh, what happens when we're allowed to move around again? You know, we're still going to be in a very big transition where riding and riding transit in crowded conditions um, may be of concern, um, but biking and walking will be we expect to be increasingly important modes because of the ability to control your space. You're out in the open air where there's, um, you know, less likelihood of uh, the virus uh, being transmitted. And, um, and so we think it's really important to think about how do we make sure that we make biking and walking as safe and as appealing in the transition out of the stay at home order as possible. Um, and so there could be a variety of strategies. This picture here is from Oakland, California, 
where they last week did an open streets um, application where they are just blocking streets to through traffic and um, slowing down speeds. So throughout a, a range of neighborhoods, a number of neighborhoods so that people can move around more safely. Uh, and that's happening now during the stay at home order. Um, but these are the types of things that people may be considering, you know, as we transition out of a stay at home order to make sure that we do have you know, a bike network here in, in Chicago and in the region, there's certainly a lot of room for improvement. And if we have a lot more people that are going to be wanting to bike and maybe that aren't as experienced bikers, we want to create space for them and make them feel safe. And then I think long term, a lot of uh, transportation planners and, um, and environmentalists are concerned that we don't want to immediately start to regress in terms of our transportation and its sustainability and go right back to auto dominated transportation because people feel that's you know the only safe way to get around so how do we proactively avoid that um, help people get around safely but also try to keep sustainability and our long-term future in mind um, you know one interesting example is milan uh, italy announced a couple just days ago that over the summer, they're going to transform 22 miles of their streets um, using temporary measures to uh, create space for biking and walking uh, as, a, as a, an explicit policy to head off a surge in, in uh, driving that they see could come and uh, to make sure that biking and, and walking are prioritized. So um, these are the types of things that we're hearing news every day uh, of different decisions and different policies cities are making. Every, every city is at a different place in the continuum with, with the COVID experience uh, in terms of the health risks, um, but transportation is, uh, is, a, is a very big factor in terms of how we transition out of this. So at this point, um, I'd like to talk um, more generally about why biking and walking is such an incredibly important part of the conversation, the transportation conversation, when we're talking about the environment. Uh, as some of you may know, transportation is now the number one sector in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And actually, I think in, in Chicago, the, the, the share is 29%. This is, this is national data. So when we're looking at uh, greenhouse gas reduction and climate change, transportation has to be part of the picture. And one unfortunate reality is if you look at the yellow line on this graphic, uh, transportation has actually been increasing in recent years, the emissions, and that's partly related to the economic recovery we, we had had over the past decade and, and its relationship with driving and that people tend to drive more during better economic conditions. Um, and, but so this just goes to show that we were going in, we had been going in the wrong direction to some extent over the past decade in terms of transportation's contribution. So we need to be working on this. In Chicago, I wanted to just highlight that um, Chicago did a regional greenhouse gas inventory, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, which is our regional um, planning organization. Um, they're a government body that um, does, you know, federally required planning and, and particularly in transportation. And they did some scenario planning at greenhouse gas emissions. And the story in this graphic is that if you look at the dotted line on the bottom, the um, climate stabilization goal, none of our scenarios gets us to that. Um, so even the most aggressive scenario, we will not reach that under um, you know, different uh, levels of reduction of GHG per capita. So that's a concern, we need to do better. Uh, we think it's really important that people understand that the path to a cleaner transportation system is multifaceted. It needs to involve um, mode shift. So getting people to using biking and walking, which are zero emissions, um, you can do that tomorrow and go from a polluting mode and, and go to a non-polluting mode overnight. Um, we need to continue to work on transit. Now transit is obviously going through great upheaval right now. And uh, there will be a lot of work to build back uh, a robust transit system, but there's no question, but that Chicago is a region that is designed around uh, 
many rail lines and bus lines and 2 million people a day ride transit on a weekday in Chicago. So that is still going to be a very important part of our transportation future. Um, so continuing to support transit um, and then phasing out fossil fuel vehicles. So electrification of vehicles, but all of this is necessary. There's no scenario by which we don't do any of these things. Um, want to share with you really quickly, this is actually uh, from a, a report that Active Transportation Alliance has done. Um, we, you know, where, we are, where are we in terms of driving um, versus other modes? And this is information about commutes. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the vast majority of people in this region, despite our robust transit system, um, do drive to work. Uh, in Chicago, it's about 50%. Um, and you see the share of, this is only work trips and many people do many other trips in a day to, to go to stores and things like that. But um, there's a lot of opportunity to increase walking and biking um, is this the story that we see here. Um, and I think the another um, important thing to recognize is the trends, the long term trends we've been on in this region in terms of vehicle miles traveled is that uh, even though our population has been not growing that much, the shift in vehicle miles traveled has gone up greatly. Our population went up 17%. The number of miles people are driving went up 70%. And this is partly related to the way we develop our land and that people are driving longer distances. They are, um, there has been sprawl development, um, which requires people to drive. And so it's important to recognize that even if population isn't changing that much, uh, sometimes vehicle miles traveled is changing. Uh, we see that uh, in the US, I think we're all aware that SUVs are very popular. Um, so compared to other countries, we have, we drive a lot of really big and heavy cars, partly because our gas is cheap. Um, and those are, those are um, very polluting vehicles compared to other countries. If we, um, if we look at, you know, how do we address this, um, this issue with um, so much driving and, and how polluting it is, um, I think there's a, a few important things to think about um, aside from, you know, the potential solution of electrifying vehicles. There's also a lot of considerations about how cars um, affect our, uh, our population and, and and what the um, issues are with them. They're very expensive. Um, it, the estimates are from AAA even um, that it's $8,500 per year to own and operate a car. So it's a real equity issue when we build uh, our transportation system exclusively around cars. People need to have options. Uh, many people do not have a car. I, I don't think many people realize that one quarter of Chicago households don't have a car. Um, we really need to be boosting other options for getting around and even more than 10%, 13% of regional households. So a lot of folks in the suburbs, even in households, don't have a car. Um, the cost to maintain our roadway system is very high. Um, so when we build a transportation system uh, oriented around cars, we are locking ourselves into large ongoing maintenance uh, costs. Um, and when we have to reconstruct those systems, they're very expensive. Um, the safety factors related to cars, uh, a thousand people in Illinois die uh, in car crashes. In Chicago alone, it's a hundred people a year are dying and 40%, 40 of those people each year are pedestrians. Um, air quality impacts, we just, we know this, um, but this nitrous oxide creates ozone. And then there's also a lot of particulate matter that's emitted into the air. Um, this is why we have a lot of people with respiratory diseases. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that actually electrification of vehicles does not help with particulate matter. That's from braking of vehicles. Um, and so that's one thing that electrification does not solve. And then finally, um, cars enable highly unsustainable development, uh, which cuts through habitats, consumes agricultural land, and uh, creates flooding. All those impermeable services are an issue. Uh, so there's actually a lot of potential for increasing walking and biking in Chicago. If you, um, if you, Look at this slide, uh, more than 50% of car trips in the city of Chicago are uh, less than three miles. That's, that's an amazing statistic. And that 
only almost a quarter or less than a mile. So this shows there's incredible potential for shifting these trips, which are relatively short to biking and walking. Uh, and so this is, you know, there's just some other reason why people are not biking and walking. And so we have to look at how do we make um, those modes more attractive. Our cycling infrastructure, Chicago definitely has been working on building its cycling network. We have 200 miles of separated striped or shared bike lanes at this point, according to the city. Um, however, the city of Chicago has a streets for cycling plan that, that its target years this year. Um, according to that plan, their target was 645 miles of infrastructure. Um, so we're far short of that goal. Um, we, and we have a large roadway network um, which can, on which we can be adding more infrastructure. And the ideal is, is, of course, protected lanes where people are separated from traffic so that people of all ages are, uh, feel comfortable cycling. In terms of walkability, uh, there's been some really interesting research over the past year. Uh, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning just for the first time ever, um, created a database of where sidewalks exist in the region. So this is very important for you know, everyone to know as, uh, as people are doing their individual research projects, um, that now we do know where there are sidewalks. Um, you can see the dark teal um, is darkest colors where there's more prevalence of sidewalks. And as you can imagine, as it gets more suburban, there are, there are fewer sidewalks. Um, but think about the necessity of sidewalks to access transit throughout the region um, and uh, the, the need for, for complete sidewalk networks. Uh, one thing that the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning does is our long range regional transportation plan called on to 2050. If you have not seen it before, I would encourage you to take a look at it. Um, this plan develops targets for different measures for how we want our region to grow and what changes we want to see. Um, one of the measures that they use is the population and jobs in highly walkable areas. So um, we want more people to be working and living in walkable places so they can take walk tri walking trips and don't need to drive um, or they're near or they're near transit. Um, so right now we see that, um, you know, as of 2015, 41% of the region um, is population and 38% of the jobs were in high walkability areas. But the long range forecasts for these measures are actually to go down because of our forecasted development patterns that we are expecting more development to occur in low walkability areas. And so this is just something we should be, we should be paying attention to, that we don't want to be getting uh, our region to be getting less walkable. We want it to be getting more walkable. And that's very related to where development occurs. I want to just quickly touch on um, the another reason walkability is so important. Um, this is a study that towards user, universal mobility is a study that the Metropolitan Planning Council developed uh, just a few months ago. It was published and want to highlight that people with disabilities as our region ages, uh, the, the share of people with disabilities increases. In fact, people age 65 uh, approximately a third of them um, have a disability that affects mobility. They often lose their ability to drive due to age or to disability. And so um, walkability is, is really, really critical um, for making our region accessible for people of all ages and abilities. So um, that's, that's something that I think has been underplayed. But every time we make things walkable, we're actually making things accessible for people with disabilities. I want to highlight kind of just a couple tangible examples of, you know, where we're at and what the implications are of having low walkability. Uh, we, you see here a pace bus stop on the left in yellow, the yellow star, and you can see the sidewalk network that leads up to that bus stop and green is good and red is no sidewalks. Um, our region is, is like this uh, everywhere where there's just uh, incomplete sidewalk networks um, to support our transit. The costs, I mean, with this COVID crisis, our revenues for transportation are gonna be down substantially. Uh, and it just, 
it's really, really important to highlight how affordable it is to build and maintain infrastructure. Here's a couple stats from the Chicago region. The cost to build 100 miles of new bikeways from 2011 to 2015 was only $12 million. The cost, the projected cost to like rebuild a few highways is $7 billion. So, I mean, it's just, it's just um, startling, uh, the cost issue, and we're going to be really needing to pay attention to this in the post-COVID era. So um, now just I'll go through a few more slides uh, quickly about, you know, how do we get there? How do we make our region more walkable? Um, and I'm going to just show a, a few slides from the Centers for Disease Control, uh, which, you know, we're hearing from them a lot about COVID. Uh, but they actually have a pretty big presence when we're talking about active transportation, because if communities are built such that people can integrate biking and walking into their everyday life, people are going to be healthier. Um, so they have this series of diagrams that just show uh, that if you want to live in an activity friendly community, you need to have safe ways to get to key destinations. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of people that feel they need to drive their kids to school because it's not safe to walk. Um, because the roads are too fast or there are no sidewalks, so they drive their kids to school. And any parent wants their kids to be safe, but uh, we really need to acknowledge that if we can just make those sometimes relatively small changes into our infrastructure, um, we can enable biking and walking. So there's other examples of a crosswalk, just takes a, just takes a crosswalk to get to the library. Um, shared use paths, which we see a lot more in suburban locations, these are not only for recreation, these can be important uh, to helping people get to key destinations like work. Um, so let's think holistically that, um, you know, biking and walking is not just recreation, it really is an important mode of transportation. Um, and this one is just a grocery store. Uh, how many people will just drive around the block because there's not a good walking connection? Um, how do we make those connections more appealing? Another facet of this is, is certainly safety. Uh, Vision Zero is a traffic safety plan done by the city of Chicago. Um, the goal is to eliminate traffic fatalities and serious injuries. Pedestrian safety is a really big part of this and reducing auto speed. So providing good quality bike and pedestrian infrastructure and reducing speeds is, is sort of the moral of the story. And um, Vision Zero has actually analyzed where there's a need for this infrastructure, uh, which would largely be bike and walking infrastructure. And it, you see that this shows up in low income communities, um, communities of color that have been, been historically disinvested. Um, and so that's just an important um, facet of this whole story of making biking and walking more feasible and accessible and safer. Just a few more slides about, um, about technical support. Um, there are, you may have heard of the concept of complete streets. This is a very important framework in terms of how we look at transportation corridors. Historically, um, you know, 100 years ago, streets were built for walking. Um, then we've tried to retrofit them for cars. Uh, and a lot of places it doesn't really fit all that well, or we've made very, very wide streets. Now the, uh, the understanding is that we need to make transportation corridors work for everybody. And so this is a really important hierarchy here. Um, the Chicago Complete Streets Design Guidelines actually has this hierarchy where pedestrians should be the priority, then transit, then bicycles, and then autos. So just think about that when you're walking around, is that, is that the way it feels? Um, and we need to be really um, encouraging that communities develop complete streets policies, and that every time they're doing work on their street quarters, that they're actually prioritizing biking and walking and transit. This is what it can do, and this is not the best picture, but I, I picked it because it shows that when you change, um, when you build a community with complete streets, it changes how people work, move around. So on the left side, before the improvements, 30% of people walking. On the right side, 43% of people walking. So people's behavior will change um, when you implement complete streets. Uh, development, I've mentioned a few times, we need to have multi-use development, um, not sprawl development where everyone has to drive. And there are a lot of cul-de-sacs where people can't 
uh, everyone is forced to go out onto the main arterial roads. That is, um, that is a very undesirable situation and that makes people feel they have to go a really long distance to get anywhere and then they don't want to walk. Um, so we need to really pay attention to any future development and make sure it's walkable. Not this. <laughs> um, trees, I know this is an environmental audience, uh, just thought it was worth noting the importance of trees as we're all trying to um, do everything we can to improve the environment. Um, when we prioritize trees along walkable corridors, uh, it can make, um, make them much more uh, appealing, shaded, uh, reduce the heat effects and make walkability more uh, desirable even in hot, uh, during hot weather. So um, just wrapping up here, overall um, biking and walking really makes better, place ma makes better places. Uh, it improves the context of where people live and it also has a dramatic impact on environmental outcomes. I wanna highlight two um, cities, global cities that have, uh, as they've set their, their climate goals, they've really focused on transportation as a central part of that. Um, so we've, Copenhagen is well known as being a very bike friendly city, one of the best in the world. They're also very aggressive on their environmental goals. They wanna be carbon neutral by 2025. And you'll see that they have estimated that they need to make at least 75% of all trips by foot, bike, or public transportation to meet that goal. And they are um, doing the work to incentivize biking and walking, giving that in infrastructure. And then similarly, Vancouver also has a very aggressive climate goal uh, to reduce pollution by 2030. And um, they've also set targets um, and they, they've reached them. They've already, by 2020, they, they reached um, their goal that half of all trips be on foot, bike, or transit. Um, and their target is by 2040 for two thirds of those trips to be bike, walk, and transit. And so these are, this is what it takes to achieve climate goals. So, um, you know, what can you do at this point? Uh, you know, as we're uh, thinking about the future, uh, we're in this present moment where we get to reflect and um, pause and think about our environment. Um, we need to recognize um, that our transportation system has been very biased towards cars for about 50 years. Um, we need to try to work to reverse that by investing in sidewalks, bike lanes, and multi-use paths. Um, think about biking and walking for your shorter trips. Encourage others to do so. We need to reduce the number of vehicle miles traveled. A lot of those trips could be shifted to other modes. Uh, we need to encourage placemaking activities that support walkability and complete streets and advocate, uh, advocate for trees, especially in walkable areas. So I think with that, um, and then lastly, um, I think to conclude, we all want to build our cities and our world back better after COVID. This is a super big shock um, to everything and to transportation in particular, but how do we build our city back better? When we start to be able to leave our houses, um, how can we make a system that is more walkable and more sustainable and more environmentally friendly? So I will wrap up there. Uh, there's my information and I know um, we're gonna turn it over to Linda now. All right. So I'm gonna, I should stop my share. Okay. And I'll start my share. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, can everyone see that? I'm still learning how to navigate this. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. That was really good framing for what I'm gonna be discussing, like, uh, particularly thinking about how you approach um, policies around uh, walking and biking through an equity lens, which is something I'm particularly interested in and um, really dedicated to getting involved in organizations that um, are working towards this. So I'll be talking a little bit about different initiatives and some different groups I'm a part of. Um, so to start off with, I wanted to highlight the Untokenate Network, um, part of the core organizing. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, sure. I, I don't think I'm sharing your screen yet if you're intending to. Oh, okay. See, my technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see. I just wanted to... Uh... Okay, okay. I think I have it. All right. Can you see that now? There you go. There you go. Okay. 
So yeah, this is the slide you missed. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so the so the first thing I wanted to highlight is the Untokening, which is a national uh, collective, a multiracial collective that centers the lived experiences of marginalized communities to address um, mobility, justice, and equity. Um, and it was founded in 2016, and it's had since 2016. There's been annual convenings in different cities across the country. It started in Atlanta. Um, then Los Angeles, which is the first one I went to, Detroit and Durham, um, and very focused on approaching, thinking about biking and mobility around uh, marginalized communities. So Los Angeles was focused on the black community in LA and Lemur Park and the different concerns they have around mobility, such as um, thinking about the rail expansion, the Crenshaw line, and how they're concerned about displacement and what kind of barriers they have to biking in LA. Um, which include kind of pollution and, and other kind of things and gaps of infrastructure. Detroit was very focused on uh, thinking about the bus network and how Black Detroiters navigate their city and what kind of gaps they have in their bus system. And Durham, which was this fall, was also thinking about um, just the gaps in mobility for particularly the Black community in the South. Um, so all of them have been really focused on thinking about communities that often get left out of conversations around biking and walking, mobility. Um, and the core organizing team is comprised of people from across the country, um, the Midwest and West Coast, and um, people from Chicago have attended all convening, so Active Trans has been at all of them, I think, um, and different people from um, Chicago have also attended the different convenings. And something that the network developed, which I wasn't a part of the development of these, but the principles of mobility justice. And these principles were basically meant to provide a, a framework for how to develop recommendations around mobility that are rooted in the liberation of historically marginalized communities. So each principle is broken down into a problem, principle, and action. So I'll give some examples to kind of highlight more of their importance. Um, so for example, this is one of the ones that um, kind of wants to center how we think about his history in terms of when we're approaching infrastructure. So mobility justice demands that we fully excavate, recognize, and reconcile the historical and current injustice experiencing, experienced by communities with impacted communities given space and resources to envision and implement planning models and political advocacy on streets and mobility that actively work to address historical and current injustices, injustices experienced by communities. So I think this was particularly important, which I wanted to highlight is thinking about when we approach our work, how, how much are we giving homage and considering histories of communities, which history plays a really big role in uh, the way communities have developed and also their, their current, um, I would say, uh, consideration for different policies around biking and walking, like in thinking about how government and different organizations have interacted with different communities in the past, um, I think is really important to consider as we approach um, policies. Uh, this is another important one that I wanted to highlight, uh, mobility justice demands an understanding of the relationship between policing and public space, um, which is something that's uh, comes up a lot around mobility um, in Chicago, on th considering how different policies have a potential to criminalize and increase policing in communities that have faced over policing for a long time. Um, so this this uh, specific principle rejects uh, law enforcement, such as increased ticketing, beat cops on bikes as a solution for street safety. Um, and we saw the the report I think a couple years ago that the Tribune highlighted around uh, the big the disproportionate impact of bike ticketing for uh, black communities versus more um, affluent white communities on the north side. Um, so I think that's one example of considering how policing might, uh, might be a barrier for people to wanting to engage in uh, things like walking and biking, which are sustainable, but other factors play a role in whether people um, want to engage in those activities. And th so this is a resource we just developed. Um, I helped I hold write it and we, we had a conversation at the core organizing team and we felt that it was necessary to develop some sort of resource where we could talk about mobility justice and during the current context because I, uh, I don't think any of us were prepared to talk about what does mobility like transit walking biking look like in a pandemic era I don't think any of us were really prepared to have that conversation and what does it mean and and there's just been a, there's been just a lot of conversations rapid conversations about what needs to be done um, and part of it's like I think navigating how much of it do we need to do it right away and how much can we take the time to really 
uh, think through more of the like equity implications of different things that are being proposed. So uh, we came to we came together to develop this framework, um, and it's on our website if you wanted to uh, read through it. I won't read all of that for you. I'll spare you. <laughs> Um, and this is this is one of the ones uh, recommendations we highlighted in that specific uh, resource around uh, COVID and mobility justice. Uh, support the organizing efforts of exploited delivery and mobility workers. So there's still a lot of essential workers, um, and some of them are on bikes and delivering uh, like food to people or delivering other goods and thinking about how people that care about walking and biking could be aligned to those essential workers that are putting their lives on the line to like keep things moving. Uh, I think that should be like an important thing that we consider as people that are interested in getting more people to walk and bike, how we can um, align with uh, the most marginalized right now. And this is one of the quotes, we had a Zoom conversation last, uh, last uh, end of March. And uh, this is a quote that I thought was really compelling uh, that somebody said, so before laying down a bike lane or keeping a trail open, instead look at the live loss and address that. Um, and this isn't specifically about the Lakefront Trail. So there's people from across the country on the call, but the sentiment was basically thinking about um, how do we center the, I, the kind of the crisis around the people dying and how do we center that in terms of how do we approach conversations about what does biking and walking look like? Um, Cause there have been calls like in Chicago and on other places to keep trails open for recreation. And um, some people might see as that as tone deaf if we're not considering that, like there's still a lot of people dying from um, this pandemic. And how do we approach those conversations honestly um, and, and considering the people that are still um, running risks. So I think that this is a really compelling quote, um, kind of I'll, just a lot to uh, grapple with, but I thought it was a very honest way to consider some of the conversations that are happening. Uh, and this is our latest effort. So we're gonna be starting uh, bi-weekly talks. Um, so centering uh, like different critical issues around mobility um, and inviting kind of planners, uh, BIPOC planners, so black, indigenous, people of color uh, to have these conversations. So around transit riders, the role of planners during a pandemic, policing and community safety, so delivery workers and open streets. Uh, so we're gonna be kind of addressing a lot of different topics that um, have implications for walking and biking um, during COVID. So if you're interested, um, it's also on our website, but um, you can also like read more about it on our social media too. So a little bit more framing around uh, walking and biking during COVID in Chicago, which I think Audrey did a really good job like uh, framing it. Um, so I, I think one of, one of the things that we've been struggling with is thinking about being an advocacy organization that's for walking and biking and transit, but the kind of the public health narrative being, and, and the need is being that people um, stay home as much as possible, which is something, you know, it's, it's something really uh, difficult to grapple with. Um, and some, and like the Lakefront Trail, the Riverwalk and the 606, the crowding on a warm day in addition to adjacent parks. Um, so, and there have been calls for, for opening those um, and thinking about uh, how do you approach that safely? Um, and particularly when shelter in place is over, um, which is likely to be extended. Um, and a, a center question, central question is how do we center our advocacy around the mobility needs of essential workers? Um, and how does walking and biking play a role? So this is a statement I wrote um, for, Acti for the Active Transportation Alliance after we had a lot of internal conversations around uh, what is our advocacy look like right now and what is important to center and um, and we, we kind of talked about our approach in terms of centering the most marginalized and centering the fact that 70% of people dying in Chicago are black Chicagoans, which is not a which is not a light thing to consider. I think it's a huge thing for us as people interested in mobility justice, uh, considering who, who is dying right now. So we kind of highlighted that as something key in terms of like, what are we doing right now? And how do we alleviate those burdens for communities right now that are suffering? Um, so we, we highlighted that in, in addition to thinking, uh, kind of taking the approach of public health being really important and staying home as much as possible. Um, and also kind of laying out our thoughts around open streets, um, which we're, we're not opposed to as a concept in general. I mean, bike, we put together Bike the Drive, um, biggest open street <laughs> event in Chicago. But we kind of said that 
open streets is a very difficult um, concept to um, want to fully advocate for right now, considering that um, just the public health approach of staying home as much as possible, the possibilities of overcrowding. There's, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked around that. And, um, and what are the equity implications of pursuing policies without any room for engagement is a really big question too. Um, and I know there, there isn't a lot of capacity for engagement, um, but I guess how much do we do uh, just based on what we think is right as advocates and how much do we wait for um, because we have no real room for engaging people that need to be engaged and has the potential to replicate inequities that left a, have left a lot of people out of decision making for a long time. Um, so this is a little bit more around um, what we talked about in the statement and general our advocacy. So having conversations with local and national partners on priorities for uh, walking and biking. So we've been talking to people in Chicago, um, the, uh, Northwest Side Housing Center. Uh, we've also talked to national partners such as uh, Livable Streets in Boston, who also took a similar approach to us um, in terms of open streets. Um, and we've been cognizant not to rush into advocate topics that have picked up nationally um, and, and really taking the time to think about um, what is an a approach moving forward. Um, and making sure transit is seen in alignment with biking and walking. Um, I think some of the conversation has seemed to almost paint, uh, I, I think transit as a scapegoat and, and I think it's gonna be really challenging for, for transit moving forward when it's seen, when it's seen as unsafe. Um, but transit is a really key part of uh, a biking and walking network, thinking of like how many people bike to the train or you know, like, diff like just the connectivity of of transit and walking and biking, I think is really important to consider and and hopefully transit doesn't get left um, on the wayside because it's considered to be the least safe option, I think is really important. Um, so we're going to be thinking about that moving forward as well. So this is one resource that Active Trans developed with the uh, Cook, uh, Cook County Department of Health. And this is kind of some recommendations for how to navigate walking and biking during COVID. So travel solo or with as few as people as possible from your household, um, wear a face mask when going outside, um, avoid touching your face while traveling. Um, if you see a crowd, potentially turn around and find an alternative route. Um, so, and maintain at least six feet as possible um, if you're walking or biking. So. We just developed this and I believe we're translating them into other languages. So I also wanted to touch upon some things uh, recent that happened in Chicago, which I think is really important for us to consider in terms of advocating for walking and biking, um, thinking about how environmental justice plays a big role in that and how that also plays a big role in how people feel safe or not on um, biking and walking in the south and west sides, which goes really, which goes beyond infrastructure. Um, for example, local little village residents um, have brought up concerns about proposed bike lanes and proposed river walk expansions into the southwest side because of safety and pollutants. Um, so thinking about how infrastructure may not really address a lot of the existing environmental concerns um, on different parts of the city. So I really wanted to highlight this. So this is something that happened um, a couple weeks ago, so um, which I'm sure everyone heard about. So Hilco, um, there was an implosion of the Crawford plant in Little Village, um, and it released a, a dust cloud throughout the neighborhood. So this is one of the uh, person on a bike that captured some of the photos, um, and it capped it. The dust cloud kind of enveloped Little Village for a few blocks, um, and think I think this was really important for me to think about in terms of how we are approaching mobility at this time. How some people. Um, feel unsafe being outside for a lot of different reasons beyond um, feeling fear of a car like people have a fear of the air like not being able to breathe um, and somebody passed away uh, the next day after this implosion and people are thinking is it connected to uh, this implosion um, so i think thinking in terms of uh, like pollution and communities is really important um, i live in little village so that's something that i consider when like when I'm outside um, walking and biking um, and sometimes on certain days the air just feels different and and I was I was outside briefly um, this week the weekend of this and uh, I can't say for sure but the air definitely did feel different and yeah that does not encourage people wanting to be outside at all um, so I think it's something as people interested in sustainability and mobility 
um, thinking about how we're thinking about these issues that are facing um, communities around the city, um, particularly uh, the south and west sides. So as kind of I've talked about, I, context and intersections matter a lot in walking and biking and active transit start, start, uh, try to develop our, um, our framings around different topics that don't seem to relate to transportation but have a really big implication for it. So we wrote um, four issue briefs, um, thinking like just kind of unraveling different topics around walking and biking, for example, policing and how that intersects with transportation, how does um, how does uh, housing and land use play a role, um, considering how, uh, for example, the 606 and gentrification, um, how that was a big topic of conversation, how that's a really big, always a big topic of conversation when you're thinking about um, bringing new infrastructure and, and um, previously disinvested communities. I think that's something really important to think about. Um, so this is another one of our issue briefs. So car intern land use and how it impacts housing patterns and affordability. And as Audrey mentioned earlier, I also wanted to highlight it. So the current context of Chicago is that the vast majority of people are driving, driving to work. Um, that's just, that's the reality of things. And I, it doesn't have to be that way. But I think in order for us to um, think about how we're going to get more people walking and biking, we have to be very holistic in our approach. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly believe that um, we have to approach things on like a design standpoint, a cultural standpoint, and a standpoint that is addressing like really embedded racial inequities in our communities, um, which have to do with job access, um, which have to do with um, just the just the accessibility of, of services and goods that people have. Like how far do they have to even travel to get to a grocery store? Um, there's just a lot of different things that are going to impact whether we are able to lower that number of people driving. Um, and potentially walking and biking. So, so this is just uh, to wrap up. So how do we center equity in our goals for walking and biking? So I kind of touched upon this uh, throughout the presentation. So working in tandem with communities and considering how walking and biking can be safer is really important. Addressing pollution, um, considering barriers for bike ownership, I think is really important, um, which I, I've been thinking a lot about in terms of when we're thinking about open streets and creating new infrastructure. Well, um, like who has access to bikes? It's like a really simple question, but really not. Like, and just having conversations with friends lately, some of them have been more interested in um, like buying a bike because you know it, it feels just feels safer. But uh, they ask me how much do they cost, and you know if I say like maybe a couple hundred, depending if it's used, it, it, it's it's a lot for some people. So I think thinking about how we're how we're thinking about even access to um, to these resources is really important and. If we pursue a policy of extending like post shelter in place, extending a bike network, or open streets, are, are there bike giveaways? What kind of resources are we, are we giving people to be able to actually engage in those modes um, is really important. And consider and just, I would say, uh, working through a context that acknowledges those lived experiences and, and limited access that some communities might have. Um, Seeing safety as a key part in starting conversation around walking and biking is really important. Safety means a lot of different things for people depending on where you come from. It can mean safety from violence. It can mean safety from like, you know, pollutants. Uh, there's a lot of different things that make people feel, make people feel safe or not. And I think having um, this open conversation about what makes people feel safe? Like what would make you feel safe on a bike or walking? And the answer is going to be very different depending on what who you ask, um, and I think those answers can get us closer closer to develop policies that are more more holistic and acknowledging people's lived experiences. Um, as I mentioned earlier, just dis discussing inequities in employment access. Um, for example, my dad he drives to work, and there would be no way he'd be able to get to work if he if if he tried to bike or walk or take transit. It's just too far away, and thinking of in terms of who has access to jobs that they're able to use these sustainable modes is really important. And how do we incorporate those kind of um, conversations when we're thinking about walking and biking so we make it more of a possibility for more people um, is really important. And the last point, uh, so developing processes where marginalized communities have a say in decision making. I think it's something that people, a lot of people are talking about, but I think processes are very challenging. It's, it's, it's challenging to be inclusive. And I always say that, um, like sometimes when things take longer, it might be really frustrating, but oftentimes uh, if it's taking longer, 
I mean, the hope is that you're being more inclusive because you're taking more of the time to talk to people and engaging people that might not be engaged in like typical forms, like, like posting a survey on like social media. You might have to go to their neighborhoods or have conversations with them at like, place, really unconventional places. Um, like during the fair fairs report, I was meeting people in different communities around the city, like at a McDonald's or um, just like different places that might not seem like regular places for community engagement, but sometimes really the only way you're going to be able to talk to people that are not in these conversations. So that's pretty much it. Uh, I think we have three minutes for questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you uh, both Audrey and Linda. That was really great. Uh, I, look, there's been some great uh, conversation happening within the chat and a few of the questions that we were asked were were answered there. So I encourage folks um, in particular, if, there, if, if you have questions around accessibility uh, or how the DMV is kind of educating drivers around um, dealing with um, bikers and pedestrians, there are some good resources shared in the chat. And then a reminder that we are recording all these sessions, so the recording will be available on IEC's website as well as our YouTube channel. And in the description of that YouTube video and on our website, we're going to share all the resources that were shared within the chat here. So uh, hopefully those you can refer back to, to that as a resource. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll, we'll try and fit in maybe one question here um, that I don't think got addressed within the, the chat. And uh, I think it's a good question for both of you. So uh, what, how do you think working remotely will uh, or assuming that more people will be work, they certainly are now working in higher numbers remotely as we are probably are, many of us are. How do we, uh, you think that will um, affect walking, biking, transit um, in the kind of world going forward? Do you want to go first, Audrey? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, I mean, there's, I think, we, we really can probably expect that more people will work from home or some of the time that everyone's had this uh, significant experience with it. Uh, it. It may reduce demand on some of our transit, um, particular uh, Metro, we see that ridership on Metro is down 97% because it's, it, it serves white collar workers who have the option to work from home. Um, but there are many people who don't have the option who work from home. So there are going to be different impacts on different transit. Um, in terms of biking and walking, if you are working from home, don't forget that your commute is only one part of your life. Um, people are taking four and five trips a day and only two of them are work. Um, so wherever you live or wherever you do anything, there's going to be a need for transportation options, biking, walking, you know, near your home, um, you know, where other places you might want to go. So I don't think it, I don't think it negates or reduces the need. It's just, um, don't forget about, you know, your neighborhood <laughs> that you need improvements there, I imagine as well. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot, a lot about what it's going to look like. I think, I think, I think a lot, a lot of our stores are going to be working with those foreseeable three, three, one, 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 um, um, is limited. Um, in, terms in terms of more people bike biking for work, work. Uh, I, I there, will will be, be, there, there will be an increasing interest for sure. I usually take transit to work, to work but, but I'm not thinking, thinking I, I feel so like I think, oh, I think there's a with your audio. Um, we cut out a little bit there, but um, uh, yeah, so we're, we're getting to time here. Uh, I just wanted to. Uh, Thank everyone for joining, especially Audrey and Linda. That was really excellent. Um, I really enjoyed those presentations and learned a lot. And then for everyone who joined, thank you uh, for coming on. Um, we're we're going to keep doing these sessions um, for uh, at least another week. So tomorrow we're talking about cities and the local uh, circular economy with the Plant Chicago. Um, please join us for that. The, the same Zoom information will work. Um, and then, yeah, just, just thank you again. Recordings can be found on our YouTube and on our website. Check out the Active Transportation Alliance's website. Check out the Metropolitan Planning Council's website. And then uh, if you're not a member of IEC yet, please consider joining us uh, by visiting our site.
So uh, thank you all again. I think we're going to go ahead and stop the recording and the session uh, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.